Hello everyone, welcome to Neurosci IQ. In this episode, we are going to talk about the neuroscience of eating. So let's get started. On the agenda today, we have the introduction. We also have the weight loss drugs mechanism of action. Then we will discuss the set point theory of weight loss, as well as the role of the brain, specifically the hypothalamus on feeding behavior. And at the very end, we will have a quick summary. So as a lot of you guys have been emailing us and asking us, how do anti-obesity drugs actually work? In this video, we are going to talk about the four main mechanisms. And before actually getting started, I just wanted to mention that the best way to reduce your weight is through proper diet and exercise, and these drugs should only be used as a last resort. The first mechanism that we are going to discuss is that these drugs make changes to dietary enzymes. For example, Orlistat makes changes to lipase and, in, and it, it inhibits the enzyme. And if you think about it, if lipase is inhibited, then the fats cannot be broken down in your intestines and less fat is getting absorbed. So even though you're eating the same amount of food as before, a large amount of fats, so nutrition and calories, are getting excreted instead of absorbed. And since you are getting less calories from the food, your weight actually reduces. The second mechanism is Gelesis 100. And this is a drug that, for example, expands your stomach or it makes physical changes to your digestive tract in general. And when this happens is it makes you feel satiated or fuller. So you maybe for your next meal, you will skip it or eat a smaller portion since you're no longer that hungry. I am thing that I wanted to mention here is that for when your stomach expands, it actually inhibits the secretion of the ghrelin hormone, which is the main hunger signaling hormone in your body, which we'll discuss later. The third mechanism is that these drugs make changes to your neurons or neurotransmitter levels, and they, for example, might decrease the reward associated with food. So the eating food is no longer, for example, that rewarding or that pleasurable. You can see this, for example, when you have eaten a large meal, you no longer want to eat or continue eating, and it might actually no longer be pleasurable since you have already ate because you already f no longer feel hungry. A good example of this is the drug Contrave, which works by activating pumps in neurons in your brain. The last mechanism is that these drugs work by changing peptide levels. And a very famous example of this that made a lot of news recently is semaglutide, which increases insulin levels. And this makes you feel satiated or fuller, so you're not eating as much. And one thing that you have might have already guessed is that some of these drugs have many different mechanisms of action. So one drug could use three or even all of the four methods listed here. It's not, for example, one drug exclusively one mechanism of action. One drug could use all of them or just some of these mechanisms. And as always, this video is meant intended for educational and informational purposes. If you have more questions, you should talk to your family doctor or another physician. So for the in introduction, we will mainly focus on leptin, which is the main hunger suppression hormone in your body. The case with leptin, if you don't know, is that it is synthesized and secreted by adipocyte or fatty tissue. And leptin levels are actually correlated by the amount of fat tissue that you have in your body. So if you have more fatty storage in your body, there is more circulating leptin in your body. And this makes sense because leptin suppresses appetite. So if you already have plenty of fatty storage, then if you have more leptin levels, then it's telling your body, oh, I already have enough fatty storage. I'm not going to eat or I'm not going to have a full meal. I'm going to have a smaller portion. And as I mentioned, it is involved in satiety signaling, and it mainly does this by suppressing dopamine-releasing neurons. And if you didn't know, dopamine-releasing neurons are the ones that, in, that are involved in reward and feeling pleasure. So what leptin does is it decreases the value or the reward associated with food. 
And the funny story behind leptin is that it was discovered accidentally when a scientist discovered that a group of mice were growing and growing and growing continuously and becoming morbidly obese and they couldn't stop eating. And what he did was investigate the cause of this scenario and it led to the identification of the leptin gene. If you look at the, for example, the diagram, there is an obese mice and there is mutation in its leptin genes, which means that it doesn't know when to stop eating because it always feels hungry since, since there is no leptin there that is working in its body compared to the healthy mice on its right. So now let's discuss the set point theory of weight loss. Basically, this is one of the main predominant theories in the scientific community. And there is some problems that we will talk about later on in this video. But basically what it says is that your body has set due to its genetic factors has already set a predetermined weight as its main set point and it works really really hard to defend this value for example this value could be 150 pounds for someone and it could be 250 pounds for someone else and this really explains why for example after dieting the majority of people regain their weight or as for example you keep on losing weight your body doesn't want to lose any more weight because you're deviating from the set point that your body desires and what the body does when for example it changes changes it senses the changes to your weight there are for example two mechanisms of actions there it reduces your metabolism so you're not expending expending as much energy it also increases the sensation of hunger for example as we discussed the ghrelin hormone increases in levels and it makes you want to eat and eat so you're gaining weight and reaching the predetermined value and if you think about it this this explains why for example the majority of adults stay is a stay with like a predetermined weight range and they don't deviate from this weight range that often but there is of, of course the full picture is much more complicated and there is some problems associated with this theory mainly for example from an evolutionary perspective the set point theory doesn't make sense because the set point theory says that the body desires a certain weight but from an evolutionary perspective, it should be you know, the body should keep on adding and adding and adding weight instead of having a certain weight that it wants to defend or keep you at. Because, for example, if you think about it, if there is plenty of food, then you should put on as much weight as you can. So you have that those fat storage later on when there is like an, a starving period or there isn't a lot of food in the jungle. So from an evolutionary perspective, the set point theory doesn't make a lot of sense. And it also doesn't explain why some people continuously gain weight throughout their life and they, and they are always eating and eating and eating. Because according to the set point theory, set point theory everyone should have a predetermined set point or a predetermined weight. And these people are continuously gaining weight. So they clearly maybe they don't have a clear set point in their body which doesn't explain why this is happening another thing that i wanted to mention is that obesity and body weight of course they also have to do with environmental factors and dietary choices and even cultural choices but the main mechanism is genetic factors have actually a very strong influence on obesity and your weight and the last interesting fact is that most of a lot of the genes linked to obesity and weight are actually involved in neuronal function rather than fat or metabolism or storage and if you think about this it actually makes a lot of sense because the neurons are what telling you to eat and eat and eat or not to eat so there is actually the, there are a lot of risk genes in the brain that if you have those genes then you're more likely to gain weight so now let's get started with the role of the hypothalamus the hypothalamus plays a big role in feeding behavior as you might have recalled in other lectures on our youtube channel 
or in your other neuroscience classes. Basically what happens is that the mesolimbic pathway is involved in the cravings and food pleasures. For example, if you're eating a sandwich or your favorite meal, then there is dopamine released. And there actually the interesting thing is that dopamine is released in two parts. The first part is when you're actually chewing or staring at the food, you get a feeling of pleasure. But the second he dosage of dopamine is released after you have already chewed up the food and it's sitting in your stomach. And this makes you feel fuller and happy that you have already eaten. So it gives you a great sense of pleasure. And how and and how the scientists discovered, for example, os hypothalamus could be involved is that these, there, there are a lot of eating disorders that actually are linked to hypothalamus abnormalities. And this gave a lot of evidence that, for example, obesity and gaining weight are actually related to neurons in the hypothalamus. For example, disorders such as anorexia and bulimia that are eating disorders ha have been linked to the hypothalamus abnormalities which really backs up the evidence or the claim that hypothalamus is involved in weight gain or obesity. So now let's get to the specific nuclei of the hypothalamus. First, you have the arcuate nucleus. And what you're going to talk about in this video specifically is the AGRP and the PUMC neurons. Then we have the paraventricular nucleus and we will discuss the NPY1 and the GABA receptors and their role in obesity and weight gain. And the other two nuclei that we will talk about are the ventromedial nucleus, which is really involved in energy storage, specifically fat storage and fat metabolism and feeding termination. So what scientists have done previously is they have damaged the ventromedial nucleus in mice on purpose. And what happens is these mice keep on gaining and gaining and gaining weight because they no longer know when to stop eating. There is no signal that is like a stop eating or terminate feeding behavior. So these mice get grow and grow and grow more obese by eating a lot because they never they never feel not hungry. They never know when to stop eating. And the last nucleus is the lateral hypothalamus. And this region of the hypothalamus basically induces sensation of hunger. So it basically is the hunger center of your brain and it combines or analyzes all of the signals that is coming to the brain and makes a decision to see, oh, am I hungry? Should I eat or am I full? So it basically integrates all the sensory or the hormone information in your brain. So to talk about more about the AGRP and the PUMC neurons, basically these groups of neurons are opposite or they inhibit each, each other to a certain degree. AGRP neurons, as you talked about, are activated by the ghrelin hormone and they increase feeding behavior and they make you feel hungry. And logically, these neurons are stimulated by the hunger hormone ghrelin and inhibited by leptin hormones, which want to reduce your appetite. The downstream of the AGRP neuron activation is that they activate GABA receptors and AGRP receptors downstream, which makes you feel fuller, but also AGRP neurons also inhibit PUMC neurons. And the PUMC neurons function is briefly, to state briefly, is they make you feel fuller and they are stimulated, they are activated by the leptin hormone. But as I mentioned, they are also inhibited by AGRP neurons. Another thing that you should notice from the diagram is leptin actually directly inhibits AGRP neurons from firing. So leptin is really, really suppressing your appetite, both by activating PUMC neurons and both by inhibiting AGRP neurons. So leptin activates PUMC neurons and inhibits AGRP neurons. And the overall effect of this is that you feel fuller and you no longer want to eat. And thank you so much for watching. Make sure to like and subscribe for more videos like this in the future.